again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of my understanding. Give me a keen intellect, retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Give me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and perfect my work. We ask you this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. So a couple of years ago, uh, this is Yahi McMath, and she was declared brain dead at the Children's Hospital in Oakland. Um, this was on December 12, 2013, and, and it was a supposed, supposed to be a very simple tonsillectomy to alleviate pretty much snoring. But there were complications in the procedure, and she was declared brain dead. And what I hope to discuss today is, is really a theoretical question with very practical implications. And this is Yahi McMath, a couple of, a, uh, an image taken a couple of months ago. And the question now is, is Yahi McMath really dead? And this is the question that I would like to discuss this evening. And my lecture is going to be divided into four parts. I'm going to begin with death. Now, most of this talk is going to be theoretical, bioethics. But I'm first and foremost, as I mentioned earlier, I am first and foremost a priest. And by the grace of God, I have served uh, six months, I served six months as hospital chaplain at New York Cornell Presbyterian Hospital in the Upper East Side, where the Dominican Friars, my brothers, have a community. And I helped lots and lots of people to die, you know, and, and um, I tell my students, I know a lot of people on the other side now. And one of the things living with uh, my older brothers, as well as talking to patients um, who get old, is that one of the striking things about aging is that after a while, you know more people on the other side than you know on this side. And you know, my older brothers will say, I don't know anything about Facebook. I'm 87. I feel so alienated from the world. And so at the end of my uh, end of this lecture, after going through all of the bioethics, I like just to talk about death and dying. I'm a missionary of mercy in this great Jubilee year. So I just like at the end, we're just going to talk about death or we're just going to talk about a holy death. And we're going to talk about what is God calling us at the end of the day, after all of this bioethics is done, how are we called today to prepare for that time where we will meet our Savior face to face? So we're going to talk about death. Then I'm going to talk about total brain death, the neurological criteria. And I understand that uh, Dr. Haas was here. And so we're going, he and I are going to start from the very first principles. But as you're going to see, he and I come to different conclusions. And I'm just going to present the argument that I think is convincing, at least to myself, and then give you a chance to ruminate and think about uh, the evidence, and in prayer, hopefully, to discern the truth. I'm going to talk about TK. So TK, as you will see shortly, is a, was a long-term survivor of total brain failure. And I choose to, to talk about total brain failure instead of total brain death, only because I think that with what scientists and physicians have learned over the last 10 or 15 years, as I hope to show you today, I do not think a totally brain dead person is dead in the way that we had thought that he had been dead for so long. And then I'm going to, this is where it's very tentative because I, you know, this is one of those things where we as a society and we as a church have to take this and, and come to terms with that reality and ask, what do we do if in fact the totally brain dead person, the person who has undergone total brain failure is in fact still alive, how will that impact our understanding of death as well as our understanding about organ plant transplantation with regards to vital organs. So that's pretty much uh, the, the roadmap for 
our conversation today. So I'm going to begin with that. And I'm going to begin with a statement from now St. John Paul II in an address to the 18th International Congress of the Transplantation Society. And I was actually privileged. I was still a student brother at the time. I was privileged to be present at this audience where for the first time the church really speaks about death and the neurological criteria for death. So at this time, the, the Pope discussed that uh, talks about death and death is notice first of all it's a single event there's actually some confusion today in the literature for some people death happens over an incredibly long period of time and one of the things i think sound philosophy points out that you die at one moment but you can be dying for a while it's not that death is happening over and over and over again and as you'll see in a minute he talks about death as the total disintegration of that unitary and integrated whole that is the personal self. Now, when you move to the following sentence, you see this is a philosophical account of death. It results from the separation of the life principle or soul from the corpor corporeal reality of the person. And so you and I, and this is something you and I intuit, especially if you come from the Catholic tradition, death is the separation of the soul from the body. And so if we talk about death, I need to talk about the soul. Because one of the things I've discovered, especially talking to healthcare professionals, is we're not really clear about what the soul is all about. And if we're not sure what the soul is all about, then there's going to be potential for misunderstanding death because the soul, the separation of the soul from the body is the root philosophical account of where, where death, when death happens. So I need to talk about the soul. And at the end of the day, when I teach this in class, I say the soul is the explanation for life. Now, this isn't really important because you have to understand what it means to say explanation. If I said this, why did the chalk fall? What will you say? Gravity. So gravity is an explanation for falling bodies. In that same way, the soul is an explanation for life. So if I ask the question, why is Deacon Tom alive while this desk is dead? You will say, he has soul. This desk does not. And I don't know if this is a real plant. It's hard to tell sometimes. Yes, yes. Oh, this is a real plan. So if I ask, I was over in the other room uh, and I noticed, oh, where is it? Oh, it's a dead plastic plant. But if I ask you, you know, if I, if I say, look, there's this plant here, and I go, why is this plant alive? You have to say, this plant has soul. And that's really striking for many, especially for many Catholic Christians. They just don't get that living things have soul. If I ask, why is the elephant alive? Because the elephant has a soul. So does the pineapple tree. Every living thing has soul. And people go, whoa, that's weird. Because I thought you and I were the only ones who had soul. And we have to make the distinction. You and I have a spiritual soul. And because you and I have a spiritual soul, the spiritual soul is immortal. Now, this raises a very tricky question because a lot of my students, you know, say, Oh my God, what, what happens when my pet dies? Does my pet go to heaven? And this is a very interesting question, right? Now, you're, every animal has a soul, but that soul, to the best of our knowledge, is not a spiritual soul. And I have no time at this time to, to defend that statement, to say that the human being has a unique kind of soul. It's a spiritual soul because the unique, the, the human being, you and I are able to do something spiritual that animals cannot do, and that is to abstract. And when, when my students go, what does that mean to abstract? I, you know, they go, animals can feel. I go, yes, they can feel. They can think too. If you think in terms of like, what's going to happen tomorrow? How is, if a wolf is hunting a deer, it's thinking. But it's thinking is not the kind of thinking that you and I can do. You and I can do, in the scholastic terminology of Aquinas, we can abstract. Now you go, what does that mean? And the best explanation for that is, 
is to talk about my being a fifth grade teacher. Because by the grace of God, I was a fifth grade teacher after I finished college. And one of the most difficult things that I had to figure out was how to teach 11-year-olds the concept of a half. You and I know what a half is. It's really easy, half. Try to teach that to someone who has no clue. So I have to take, I have had to take a banana, I cut it in half, a chocolate bar, you cut it in half, then a pizza. And I said to the class, this is a half, this is a half, this is half. And they're looking, they're looking, they're looking. I'm like, you know, there's a banana, so it can't be. And they're trying to figure out what is common amongst all three things. Half of a banana, half of a chocolate bar, and half of a pizza. Because you see, half is what's common amongst those three. And so they're looking, and then you see, ah, and one kid gets it. He goes, I know what half is. That's abstraction. You see, dogs can see the banana. They'll be able to see the pizza. They'll eat it quickly. They'll eat the chocolate, but they won't get half. And that ability to abstract spiritual realities from material things is something that you and I, the angels, and of course God can do. That's why all living things have soul, but we have a spiritual soul. And I just wanted to clarify that to make sure that we don't have any confusion. So the soul is the principle of life. The prince, this is a um, technical term in metaphysics. It's an explanation of life. Why is this plant alive? It has soul. Now, it is also the principle of organization, unity, and embodied integrity. In other words, it's an explanation for, for organization, unity, and bodily integrity. What does that mean? I go, that's my pinky. How do you know that's my pinky? Well, because this pinky, this little finger, is part of me. And this is, I am one thing. Now, there are billions and trillions of atoms in my body. But they are constituted into one living organism. And I go, why am I one, not two? You go, because I have one soul, and my soul makes me one. That's what unity is. And how do I know that all of these things work together, that this hand and this hand are coordinated? I can do all things because we have the same soul. So this is a technical term. It's the substantial form of the body. And this is actually defined by the Council of Vienne, not Vienna, Vienne in 1312 as part of the Catholic faith over a dispute over the nature of the soul. So if you now go back and you ask from St. Thomas, this is a summa, the first part, the first part of the summa. He asks, what's a soul? A soul is a cause. Again, a cause is another name for explanation. If I say, again, gravity is a cause for this falling. So the soul is a cause of an organism of a natural kind. It explains its unity, its integrity, and its organization. Now, notice, since the soul is the cause of the body's integration, the separation of the soul must lead to its disintegration. Because if the soul is what puts it together, if you get rid of the soul, it's got to fall apart. It's a very simple cause and effect argument. So if you ask, what is death? Death is loss of the soul. You see, we can also conclude that death must therefore be the loss of integration, which is why when our Holy Father spoke about death, he would say, this is then considered the sign that the individual organism has lost its integrative capacity. Death is loss of the soul. Since the soul integrates, the absence or loss of the soul leads to loss of integration. Does that make sense to everyone? That's just a very classical account of death. So now we have to go to total brain death. Um, I'm just going to give you one picture of the brain just to give you a sense of how the brain has regions that are specialized for different functions. So the frontal lobe cortex 
this what part of the brain is involved in thinking, judgment, reasoning, this matures at about when, when the human organism is 25 years old. This is why college students are young and dumb. Because this part has not yet matured. You know, and I tell my students when they do dumb things, I go, lack of frontal lobe development. Give you a couple of more years. And it's amazing, they grow up. Now, growing up involves spiritual, emotional maturity, but it also involves developmental and biological maturation of the frontal lobe. So this is the cortex. This is the main part of the brain. It's the largest part of the human brain. This is the cerebellum. This is the part of the brain that is damaged with cerebral palsy. If you've seen individuals who struggle with cerebral palsy, they have um, movement difficulties, especially little children, infants who, for one reason or another, experience brain damage. That's this part of the brain that was damaged. Now, I'm going to point your, your attention, I'm going to draw your attention to this. This is the brain stem. This is the part involving breathing, blood pressure, heartbeat, swallowing, alertness and sleep, body temperature and digestion. This is the most primitive part of the brain. It has the most fundamental functioning of you as an animal. You are a rational animal, but the, and this is the rational part. This part down here is the animal part. And as you will see, it's the animal part that we are really looking at at total brain death. If you now go and you look at the United States and in most of the world, the neurological criteria for death is the failure of the whole brain, that whole picture, the rational animal part, the part that is involved in thinking and making judgment, and the part that is involved in breathing and blood pressure, which is this part right here, which is why if I hit you at the back, you'll pass out because I shock the brainstem. Um, that's important for that. Now, in the United Kingdom, the neurological criteria is the failure of the brainstem alone. And we, we, I'm not going to spend much time making any arguments or distinctions between the two. Now, there are tests for this. So uh, if you are diagnosed with brain death, so if you, if you see it on TV, what happens is, over a series of days, a physician can do these tests to look for the presence or absence of neurological activity in the brain stem. So for example, if they squirt, if I squirt water in your ear, you will not be able to control your eyes. Your eyes will start moving in the direction of the water. This is just the way it is. If I put a light into your uh, pupils, I mean, if I shine a light into your eye, your pupils will actually, uh, well, well, will constrict. So you have the dilation, the movement of the pupils in response to the presence or absence of light. This is all gone when you have totally brain dead individuals. Now, you can also see that if you do brain scan, so all I'm going to tell you right now is the colored yellow is where the brain is active. And... So if you, the, the bluer it is, the less active you have. And in a brain dead individual, there is no blood flow. So this is a measure of blood flow. And basically you don't have blood moving to the brain. And for a control, this is someone who's not brain dead. Basically the brain is active and alive. Now I have to make a distinction. This is an incredibly complicated, but very helpful graph. So on the, on the, on the, you have the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. Let's go through this. The vertical axis is awareness, right? If you are down here, it is less aware. If you are up here, you are more aware. So if on this side, you have awakeness. So here, this is what happens when you're less awake and here you're more awake. So what usually happens is, you know, when we're passed out, we're down here where we're like not awake, not awake, and we're also not aware. And as we slowly wake up, there's light sleep, there's drowsiness, and hopefully most of you are consciously awake. So you're, mo <laughs> you're very awake and you're very aware. Now, what's striking actually is that we can have situations where there are individuals. So this is the persistent vegetative state. And the most famous one is Terry Schiavo. Terry Shiva was awake, but not aware. 
And uh, what that means is she woke up in the morning, she was awake and her eyes would open, she'd um, move her eyes, and then at night she'd fall asleep. But if you said, Terry, Terry, there is no awareness. She is awake, but she is not aware. So a lot of people get confused between the persistent vegetative state and brain death. This is two very separate things. Brain dead individuals are neither awake nor aware. It's the deepest form of coma that we understand. Okay. Now, one of the things, I'm just going to go back to this, is that uh, it's not quite clear. So there are stories of individuals in the PBS who, sl who slowly, as their brain heals, move up into what's now called the minimally conscious state, and hopefully, God's grace, they wake up. But there's also individuals who basically stay here for a long time. And we're not, we don't know enough about the brain to know about whether or not how we can predict whether or not something is going to, someone is going to make prog progress or not. Now, there is a consensus today, both Catholic and secular, that um, a total, totally brain dead patient is dead. And what I need to do now is I need to explain how we got to where we are. And I'm going to do it in two ways. One is I'm going to focus in on the secular tradition of bioethics, which is the predominant tradition. It's the predominant intellectual framework of bioethics, not only in our country, but pretty much in the West. And in order to deal with how the secular tradition deals with death, we have to go back to a very famous article in 1968. It's the report of an ad hoc committee at Harvard describing what they call irreversible coma. And if you look at the report, they want to define irreversible coma as a new criterion for death. We do not need to talk about the context for the movement to define this. Uh, the first heart transplant had just been done. So there is a lot of, it, it's, it's a very complex history. A lot of people are suspicious of this movement. I think we can just simply take the movement for what it was an attempt to redefine uh, death to where death prior to this was simply the irreversible cessation of respiration and heartbeat, we now move to brain activity. And what's interesting is they point out, so then the, 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 the Harvard committee says, well, why is it that for so long we thought that death involved the cessation of heart of the heart beating and the lungs breathing. And they said, well, at the end of the day, the, from ancient times down to the recent past, it was clear that when the respiration and heart stopped, the brain would die in a few minutes. And so they wanted to link the classical ancient understanding of death to the modern account. But no justification was given for why this constituted death. And so you had to wait basically from 68 to 81. This is the President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine. This is defining death in 1981. And this is where the secular tradition provides an account, an explanation for why a brain dead patient is dead. And the account is this. Death is that moment in which the body's physiological system ceases to constitute an integrated whole. And you can see that the Catholic tradition, because it's, it's bound not on theological presuppositions, but a sound philosophical account of the human person, dovetails very nicely with what the President's Commission said in 1981. And so what you have here Although absence of breathing and heartbeat may often have been spoken as defining death, what they wanted to say is that at the end of the day, breathing and heartbeat were considered the cessation of both, the absence of both were considered death because this was evidence for the disintegration of the organism as a whole. Notice again the emphasis on disintegration. And the Catholic philosophical tradition would have had no problem with that. It's a sound account. So what happens here, you see, so it says, after brain death, the body ceases to be an integrated organism and rapidly becomes a disintegrating collection of organs. So in 81, everyone agreed that death involved disintegration 
And one of the things you need to know, and so at the end of the day, this was the argument. Death is a loss of integration. Total brain death is loss of integration. And there were, in 1981, after you underwent total brain failure, you pretty much died. So the, the, the understanding is there was incredible instability. Your body was falling apart. And so what happened was the assumption is, why is it falling apart? Because it's lost integration. So total brain death equals death. This is a standard account. And so in 1981, we have the Universal Determination of Death Act, and this is where it legalizes and enacts into legislation, not only in this country, but all over the world, that total brain death is death because you have disintegration of the body, the body falls apart. And it's for this reason that our Holy Father, the Holy Father will say in the year 2000, the complete and irreversible cessation of all brain activity if rigorously applied, does not seem to conflict with the essential elements of a sound anthropology. Because it makes sense. You see, the secular tradition and the Catholic tradition, which is a sound philosophical anthropology, dovetail. And when you get to Benedict XVI, he says, he doesn't actually talk about brain that he just simply said, the extraction of organs must be performed in cases of true death. And so this is the discussion of true death. Now we're going to talk about TK. And uh, the heart of my lecture is basically that TK challenges that settled conviction. And I'm going to present some evidence to suggest that this is the case. So who is TK? TK is a long-term total brain death survivor. And um, I wrote and I published uh, an article in the Linacre Quarterly describing his autopsy report, because I think his autopsy report is really helpful in illuminating and giving us more information for evaluating the, de the brain death criteria. So let me just summarize. So he was declared brain dead at four and a half years of age after he developed meningitis. And uh, they talk about the swelling of the brain su such that the brain actually separated, the brain skull separated because there was so much swelling. He was taken home and cared for by his family, by his mother, for 20 years in the basement of her house, All right? He experienced cardiac arrest at age 24 years. So he was alive for 20 years in her basement with basically um, a vent. He was ventilated and she gave him uh, basically in short. And he experienced cardiac arrest at age 24 after he was placed on a DNR, do not resuscitate list. Now, uh, they, do a, they do an autopsy on his, on his brain, and this is his brain. Basically, there is no brain there. It's a gigantic clot. So if you look at it, you've, you've had a wound, you've got a clot. When they opened it up, they couldn't see any structures resembling a brain. And so the brain was definitely dead and it and it had atrophy to the point where it was replaced by scar tissue. You had one gigantic scar in the middle of this young man's head. Now here's the question, had TK lost his integration? You see, this is the point, right? Because if TK is dead, if TK is dead, then for 20 years, he should have lost his integration. And that's really what uh, the central point of my, my, because if he is dead, he should not be integrated. Now I'm gonna have a little digression here. What is bodily integration? We have to have a little, little conversation about that. And I'm gonna bring up a symphonic orchestra. You know, the symphonic orchestra is made up of many, many parts, but it's integrated when it's done well. In fact, if it's not integrated, you are subject to pain. <laughs> but if it's integrated, all the parts have their place. All the parts are working together for one end. And the end is the music, right? The music, the fifth, for example, or, oh, I don't know. There's so many amazing ones. Uh, and so what happens is the individual parts, you know, the clashing of symbols, boom, it makes no sense. Like, 
Why is he doing that? But if you step back and you look at the whole, you realize that it is the whole that gives rise to the integration. And the integration is everyone needs to know which part. So you don't want the drums doing their thing unless the violins are doing their thing. Everything has to fit. And so the integrated whole provides an intelligibility to the parts and you have activities of the whole for the whole. So the orchestra is doing something and it's not individual instruments anymore, it's the orchestra. And the orchestra is doing something together. And so this is the definition, but I'm gonna point out at the end of the day, we don't need a definition. We just need to agree that you and I are integrated because you and I are alive, we hope. And so because you and I are alive, we have to ask the question, and this is the question I'm gonna have, right? Did TK, remember TK is 20 years brain dead, manifest any activities after the tragic accident, the illness, that suggests that he was still integrated like you and I are integrated, you see? So if I'm comparing two symphonies, I don't need to know how to define an integrated symphony. I just need to know, can this group of instruments play something that this symphony, which is a legit symphony, they can play it? Let me hear you play it. And I'm gonna propose to you, there are at least three signs of integration that his autopsy reveals his growth, his immune response, and his water homeostasis. Now, you may not realize it, right? But you grew in a particularly specific way. I don't know if you realize, newborn babies are all head. Did you know that? I mean, if you see it, right, it's all head. Now you hope that the head grows in proportion to every other part of the body. Otherwise, some of us would have heads this big. So there is a proportionate growth. In fact, how does your left hand know what your right hand, well, left hand and right hand? There is integration between the growth. Everything has to talk to each other in order to grow properly. Do you see that? And one of the striking things, if you look at TK's, remember TK goes from four to 24. So that's a lot of growth. Everything was proportionate. He didn't have like a really large left foot. You know, his left foot and his right foot were the exact same size. His legs were the same size. His hands were the same size. How does that happen? Because his left foot and his right foot and his left hand and his right hand, they have to be talking to each other. You, you don't have each one doing its own thing. I propose that this is one side of bodily integration it's a, it's an incredible sign of integration that happens all the way through your life in fact when the integration doesn't work properly you have individuals we call them little people dwarfs you notice there is a difference between small people and midgets where the proportions are different we actually don't as biologists we do not understand how that integration is working we know it's there we just don't know how it quite works. Second thing, you have an immune response. Now, for those of you not biologists, the immune response is what keeps you alive every time someone else in your classroom has a cough. They cough and you, <coughs> right. All of this stuff is all over the place. You breathe right into it, but you don't get sick. Now, of course, every this is the time all my students are getting sick. So I'm like popping the zinc pills, popping the zinc <laughs> pills. Because it turns out that this is actually, there's a lot of incredible data that shows that zinc helps this, this army of cells in your body protect you against all those little buggers that your students and your classmates are bringing into the classroom. Now, I want you to realize that this is like any army. There are lots of different moving parts. There are, I'm just gonna call them out, there's B cells and plasma cells and T cells and, and cytotoxic lymphocytes. Uh, the reason why AIDS is so devastating is because AIDS cripples, the HIV virus cripples this. It's like if I knocked out all the generals, the whole army just doesn't know how to function. But notice that presupposes that the army is incredibly integrated and working together. 
right? If you start knocking off generals and no one's quite sure how to talk to from one part of the army to the other part, not surprisingly, that army is not going to be a successful army. Now, there is a prediction then. The question asked is, how did TK respond to illness? Turned out in his 20 years, he was fine. His mother would just pop him an aspirin every so often, give him penicillin. Whenever he got sick with a really, really bad infection, she just gave him antibiotics. How many of you are antibiotics today? No one? Not yet? Eventually, a bunch of you will be because as the flu season comes in and everyone gets sick, you're given antibiotics to sustain your immune system, but your immune system is integrated. And this is what's so striking. The expectation is a disintegrated organism would not be able to mount an immune response in a way that he is able to mount it for 20 years. He's, his immune response was able to keep him healthy for 20 years. Next, this is maintaining water homeostasis. Basically blood pressure. Some of you may be struggling with high blood pressure. And you notice high blood pressure involves many organs. It involves blood vessels and kidneys and um, hypo the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus. Again, there are many different parts that need to talk to each other. This afternoon, um, the king of Thailand died at age 88. And um, I grew up in Thailand and, and um, it's, it's historic. One of the things that if you've been watching his death, is that on Sunday, it became very clear that he was dying. And the reason why he was dying was because his, his blood pressure started to go crazy. And they were struggling, they have been struggling over the last five days to keep his blood pressure together. It was erratic, it was moving up and down, and eventually he succumbed to disease and he died uh, at 3.52 this afternoon in Bangkok. And the whole country is in mourning. Now notice, it took the, the royal doctors an incredible amount of effort to keep the king alive from Sunday to today because his body was unable to, by itself, stably maintain his blood pressure. But what is so striking is that TK was fine for 20 years. He would get sick, and yeah, when he got sick, he'd get into the hospital, he'd have like blood pressure problems, but whenever he got well, he'd go back home to his basement, to his mother's basement, and his blood pressure was fine. And, and, and what I'm proposing to you is that this water, the homeostasis, the water, the whole body able to regulate its water content and therefore blood pressure involves necessarily all of the body working together as one. You cannot have a symphony. The symphony has to play together in order to get uh, a symphony played. Now, so here you have it, right? Despite 20 years of total brain failure, he has several activities of the whole for the whole. And I'm not even gonna talk about pregnancy. So we have, we have women who are pregnant, who are, who are declared brain dead, and for four months until the child, the fetal child is brought to term, they keep her in the hospital. Pregnancy, for those of you who have been pregnant, as you know, is a whole body affair. The whole body keeps the woman together. And one of the striking things is we still don't know how to, the we don't even know how to make an artificial uterus because all of the parts are so complex that we have to keep everything together. And yet uh, there are many cases of brain dead pregnant women who are able to take their child to term, suggesting that there is still an integration. Now, I told you, I told you that uh, in 1981, most of the patients who were declared brain dead would die and they died in they would basically die within a week and it turns out that what happened is that at the point of brain death there was incredible instability in the body which is not surprising your body has has spent all of its life with the brain basically running the show 
And then what ends up happening is you get rid of the top and the whole thing gets unstable. But here's what's striking. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So people said, well, that patient is dead. So allow him to die and die. So what's happened, and I'm going to talk shortly about Alan Schumann. Alan Schumann is a Catholic uh, neurologist, and he basically said, look, what happens if you keep the person stable for a little bit beyond this crisis period? It turns out they stabilize, just like anyone who gets really sick. If you've been really sick, there's a crisis period where everyone has to keep you together because if they don't keep you together, you die. But if you get past that crisis stage, and as a priest of Jesus Christ, I've had the privilege of helping families get through this crisis phase, they're able to make it. And you see, there's nothing different, it turns out, with total brain failure. If you get really injured, your body goes into shock. And if you are able to maintain that body in shock uh, so it's able to stabilize, you're able to, 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 to keep going. So I'm proposing, and this is very controversial, that TK was still alive. The, alive as he maintains an integrative capacity and therefore his soul is still there. And because his soul is still there, he's still alive. And there are not corpses. You know, this is so striking. Uh, TK and Yahi are severely disabled patients. They're di severely, they're probably the most disabled you can get. But they're still, but they're not corpses. We do not bury them. And this is very striking. Now, I refer to, to, to Alan Schumann. And in 1998, um, Alan's a, he's a, he's a Catholic physician. He's a, we become good friends. He basically went into the database and he said, look, how many patients die right after brain death? And he discovered that um, he was able to, to identify a group of patients who had long-term survival. In other words, beyond the immediate, to the point where 56 of 175 survived more than one week. And there were a few who survived more than 10 years, TK being the longest survival. And so Schumann was the first to bring up this argument. He said, you know, they're still integrated. And if they're still integrated, then the Catholic tradition and the secular tradition, remember going back to 1981, should acknowledge that they're still alive. Now, there are Catholic moral theologians, scientists, and biologists who have raised several objections against Schumann's challenge, and, and I've had to go to meetings to have this conversation. I have people who've said to me they were not brain dead. So there was a misdiagnosis. So there's a so you can say, well, brain dead people really are dead. These exceptions are not exceptions to the rule; they're exceptions to the diagnosis. Now, one of the things about this autopsy report I point out is there was no misdiagnosis. There was really no brain structures, and yet he was able to survive. TK was able to survive 20 years. So that's one. Maureen Kondik, a good a friend of mine, she would say that the loss of the brain cripples the integration of the immune system. What remains is coordinated but not integrated. And, I, and um, the reason why she says this is because there's data that, said, that shows that the brain is really important for immune system. So my students, uh, I'll give you an example. My students will get very sick after final exams. It's really interesting. They don't get sick during finals. They get sick after. Now, one of the reasons why this is the case, it turns out, is that when you are incredibly stressed, your immune system um, gets activated. But as soon as that stress is alleviated, the body has to overcompensate to prevent your immune system from, from attacking itself. You do not want to develop autoimmune disease. And so your body actually hyper suppresses and you become more susceptible to disease, which means that the week after finals, everyone gets sick. Especially when you go home, your little brother, kid brother is coming home from kindergarten and coughing all over you. So it's, and it's very clear that this whole thing is integrated. But again, you see, as I pointed out to you would, if, if there was even a crippling of this integration, 
there should be immune dysfunction somewhere. But we don't see that in TK. He is not sicker than any one of us here. He does get sick, but you and I get sick. And when he gets sick, he needs antibiotics at times, like you and I get need antibiotics. But for the most part, until the very end of his life, and there are reasons why, and his mother decided just to, uh, to put him on the DNR. He got really sick with pneumonia, and, and you know, he, he, she placed him on a DNR after 20 years. There is no evidence that the immune, there was any immune dysfunction at all. Now, secular bioethicists also have responded to Schumann's challenge. And this is the very famous 2008 report from the White, from the President's Council of Bioethics. And what is striking about this report is that they, they actually say, it is difficult to deny that the body of a patient with total brain failure can still be alive, at least in some cases. And this has to deal with integration. So what's striking is the secular bioethicists acknowledge that, the, that integration remains. But what they now do is they redefine death to get away from integration. So then they go, Determining whether or an organism remains a whole depends on recognizing the persistence or cessation of the fundamental vital work of a living organism. And they say this is breathing, breathing on its own. So then now you notice from 1981 to 2008, they have moved away from an integrative criteria because they realize the integrative criteria actually doesn't work. And they've now moved to a vital work criteria. And um, so you go, on this account, total brain failure can continue to serve as a criteria because it, not because it necessarily indicates complete loss of integrative somatic function. See, we're now, that, this is an implicit acknowledgement that the brain dead patient is integrated. We're just gonna move it on, but, because it is a sign that the organism can no longer engage in the essential work that defines living things. And so if there are no signs of consciousness and if spontaneous breathing is absent, then the person is now dead. So you see, you can still be integrated, but if you can't do these, you're dead. Now the philosopher in me goes, but what about the soul? You see, we've completely, the secular tradition has moved completely away from an account where the soul was the integrative principle of the organism. Because how does absence of consciousness and absence of spontaneous breathing, how do those reveal that the soul is gone? See, this is the challenge that we have. And this is my objection, right? If maintaining bodily homeostasis is not a, why is breathing a vital, but not maintaining a bodily homeostasis, homeostasis like blood pressure? Why is breathing more important than blood pressure? They can do the, yes, they can't breathe, but they can maintain a blood pressure. Why is one more important than the other? And so not surprisingly, you now have movements in the secular bioethics, this is 2014, they would like to move from biological death to legal death. And so they will say, just like there is biological blindness and legal blindness, right? So there are people who are legally blind, but they're not biologically blind. There's now a move recognizing that the total, totally brain dead pa patient is in fact brain dead, uh, is in fact integrated. There, we now have to move from a biological account of death to a legal account of death not surprisingly, on choice, on consent. And I, I, I'm not going to uh, mount an argument against this at this time, but I think from a Catholic tradition, this would simply be false. It would not cohere with an authentic uh, philosophical anthropology. So now what happens, right? So, um, how, so what happens now? So we have to go, well, death is the loss of bodily integration this is most important because this is the only sign that we have for, this, for the separation of the soul from the body. Uh, it's caused by the permanent cessation of circulation and respiration. We're moving back now to the classical account. Because if, 
totally brain dead people are still alive, then we can't talk about brains. We need to talk about something. We need to go back to hearts and lungs and breathing and um, respiring. But what do we do? We need clinical criteria, you see? Because doctors have to be able to do something. And so what we have to do is there's, and this is a small study. So um, I don't know if you've heard of the Lazarus effect. So the Lazarus effect is spontaneous resuscitation. So your heart stops and without CPR, your heart goes, comes back. And basically in this very small study, uh, no one comes back after one minute of absent circulation, suggesting that two minutes of absent circulation may be a criteria to certify death. Now, I'm just throwing this out, right? This is maybe five minutes. So this is the Committee on the Non-Heart Beating Transplantation. They're saying, okay, the study, and the problem with the study is it's very small. It's two minutes, but just to be sure, we'll make it five minutes after the heart stops which is more than twice the maximum time observed for Lazarus effect. So just this is my last slide. We have the neurological criteria were grounded in an account of the integration of the human organism. And I hope you see that both the Catholic tradition and the secular tradition agreed on this until recently. Schumann, and, and Schumann was actually TK's doctor. That's how this all started. Uh, Alan basically, he basically started cataloging cases of individuals who had experienced total brain failure, but were still integrated. And it was that odd. He actually was the one who mentioned the autopsy report. And I said, well, no one's looked at that. And so I went back and looked at that and tried to extract from the autopsy report. I said, what can we learn that can inform our philosophical reflections on this issue from the autopsy report? And so proposals to move beyond this are very problematic, but we are, we are going to see it. It's going to happen. They're going to move beyond biological death to legal death. And it should be replaced, and this is a proposal that needs discernment um, and much prayer and fasting, that, that the death should be replaced by circulatory criteria where death is loss of bodily integrity, integration due to permanent cessation of circulation respiration. And then time, of course, is something we have to figure out. That's something that we, we, uh, we're not really sure about. I mean, I pr proposed this one study showed two minutes. There are, there are organizations that proposed five. We need to discern that further. So acknowledgments at the very end. Um, I have to thank uh, Alan Schumann. He's writing a book. He just retired. He's writing a book where he's describing all of the his, basically his story. Now, you should know, you should know, and I will be very transparent, that in the Catholic Church, there are pressures that want, who, that have tried to stop him from talking. I'm just going to say that. There, there have been, and it is, it has been a source of disappointment in my own life, where I've had, where I've counted that. I people have said, "You're her to to talk this way is to be heretical," because the church has already spoken, and I, and we're referring to two thousand, the Holy Father's allocution in two thousand, and I said, "I'm not challenging the Holy Father's allocution. I am asking the question: Has the science?" change since 2000 such that if the holy father himself was alive today and god willing well i'm sure he is he praying for us right now if he knew what we know today right would he i'm proposing that given the the sound anthropological principles from which he based his conclusions that he would say then in light of this new data, which is not theological or philosophical, but medical and scientific, that he would say that in fact, we need to, because there, truth does not contradict truth. So there has to be where we have to adjust accordingly. It's a prudential decision, acknowledging that medicine has moved to a point where we can say that we didn't have knowledge back then, that we certainly have now. And so it's not a theological dispute, it's a scientific medical one. 
And therefore, it's not something the magisterium has. And the magisterium very clearly says this. You know, we're, we, the church speaking as church he defers to scientists and physicians and healthcare professionals to speak about, about medical and scientific realities. And what our responsibility is, is to see the data and with, the, with God's grace and a lot of hard sweat to try to figure out how it comes together. This is how faith and reason work. And so, I mean, it's very difficult. I'm telling you, like right now, it's like journals will say, Catholic journals will say, we will not publish this because you are speaking against the magisterium. And I and I and and I and I say, you know, like like my brother Thomas Aquinas, I will submit to the church. I completely and totally. But there has to be a conversation. It has to be a conversation because there are there are people's lives at are risk, right? Not just those who are brain dead but their families and the physicians who are involved in their care, as well as the patients who receive organ transplantations. I don't want them to know that someone was, quote, killed so that they could live. And, and at working in a hospital, I know that there's already a lot of struggle. There's a lot, there's survivor's guilt. And I don't want to make it more complicated than it already is. And since I'm a, I'm a biologist, I actually have to end with, acknowledging all the money that helps someone with a vow of poverty run a laboratory. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Any questions?